guest today is Donovan Brown. Donovan, how you doing? I'm pretty good. And yourself? I'm doing really well. It's been a long time since we've spoken. I think we were in a, an Indian restaurant in Chicago. Was wow. the last time I saw you. Wow, that's right. That's right. We had lunch together. Um, exactly. I do remember that. And the last time I think I was on the show was we were in Seattle together. Uh, was years. It might have been Ready or something like that. But, something like uh, but that. I, I, all I remember is both those times and this time you've been wearing the same shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's kind what of. What are thing. the odds? <laughs> They're pretty high, actually. <laughs> uh, so we, we were chatting uh, last week about um, what we should cover in this show, and you kept mentioning something called app innovations. And, of course, my response is, what's that? Right. What is app innovations, and why are you so passionate about it? It's a it's a movement and a, and a concept that we've been developing here at Microsoft where it's about taking your existing applications and not just lifting and shifting them to the cloud, but really innovating them so that they utilize the cloud the best. And it's not just for existing apps. It's also for your next generation of applications, those that don't exist yet. We want you thinking about utilizing the cloud in the best possible way and innovating your applications such that they take advantage of the cloud fully. A lot of people just lift and shift their apps and think now we're in the cloud and they're really not utilizing all the benefits of the cloud. And app innovation is about rethinking the way you design software to make sure that when you go to the cloud, you're thinking cloud first and you're using it the best way possible. Interesting. What are the sort of things that we should be thinking about as we're moving to the cloud? Well, you don't want to live inside of a VM if you don't have to, right? So I remember when I first started using the cloud, I did like most people did. I had an existing application running inside IIS backed by SQL Server, and it was all running on, on Windows. So what I did is I lifted and shifted all of that workload into the cloud, and I'm patting myself on the back. And then I realized I still have to maintain that Windows Server. I still have to make sure that it's patched correctly. I still have to make sure that all the firewalls are managed correctly. I have to make sure that the latest virus detection is on it correctly. And should a, re a reboot be required, I am now responsible for finding out when is the most opportune time to reboot a server so that I'd impact as few customers as I possibly can. I Yeah, I'm in the cloud, but I'm not really taking, in my opinion, advantage of the cloud because that VM might as well just be in my data center, right? Because there, I didn't gain anything from it. Well, you gained the, the, the hardware maintenance. You've yeah, for sure. I shouldn't Somebody else has to replace the network card. The hard things. drives. And but, <laughs> but all those other things you're, you're, still, you're still responsible for. Yeah, and, and that's a good challenge because it's not that you didn't gain anything. You gain flexibility. You gain capacity. Um, you gain the ability to get the new hardware. You went from a, a CapEx type of, uh, of investment, right, to an OpEx type of investment. So there are some trade-offs there. Well, define those terms. Well, yeah, capital expense is an expense that you buy these big, ginormous machines that depreciate over time, and you have to put this big outlay of money up front, sometimes an exorbitant amount because you got to be ready for Black Friday and Cyber Monday, but those days only come twice a year, but yet you had to buy this equipment up front and spend all this money that you're going to underutilize for the majority of the time that you own that material versus an operations expense where you're basically just paying for what you need. And then when you scale it up, you pay the bigger price, but then when you can scale it right back down on Tuesday after the storm comes from all the sellers, and then you're saving a lot of money that way. So there's some financial benefits to going to the cloud, obviously, when managed correctly. As a developer, however, I don't want to reboot servers. I don't want to worry about patching servers. I don't want to worry about any of that stuff. So what I had to do was just like we encourage most of our customers to do, sure, Get yourself in the cloud with as little friction as you possibly can. Because one of the things we find that people do sometimes in incorrectly is they start to dream up what the future would look like. And as they're moving from on-prem to the cloud, they try to do all these different, like you're just adding variables to this equation and you're making it more complicated. Sometimes it's safer just to lift and shift, get uh -huh. yourself in the cloud and immediately start figuring out what could I, how could I be utilizing the cloud better? Could I take this SQL server that I'm running inside of Windows and actually use Azure SQL instead? By doing that, I now I'm no longer managing the SQL server. I'm no manner, no longer managing the Windows server. I am now just focused on prob solving my problem and you having this beautiful SQL server service that is just always running, always maintained. And I can, again, scale it up or scale it down should demand dictate, but not have to build this monster, multi-clustered, uh, geo-replicated SQL server for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. I can actually build what I need and scale it up and scale it out. And the same goes for not only your database, but your app tier. You currently are running inside of IIS, inside of Windows, but you could move that potentially to app service, or you could break it down and start moving it into Azure Functions, or you might even be able to containerize parts of your application, start running them inside of AKS or uh, Azure Container Instances, or even inside of app service as a container. So there's lots of ways that you can reimagine your application to start to utilize the cloud better. 
Okay. So if I, I could summarize there, this is uh, uh, reimagining this way is really allowing yourself to focus on the application and the data and the code, the things that are important to your business, and let Azure focus on things like infrastructure and scaling and patching the operating system and all the things that are important, but not necessarily core to your business. Absolutely. I, absolutely. I want my developers focused on development, right? I want them exactly. focused on solving the problem for my for my customers. And I believe by utilizing, actually Microsoft believes, by utilizing the cloud to its fullest extent, you're able to go off and innovate in ways you weren't before because you have all this free time now. That time yeah. you spent, like, what are the latest patches, uh, installing the updates, rebooting the servers, and checking, like, you don't have to do any of that anymore. So that's time you get back to go off and say, wow, I wonder if we could do X, Y, and Z in our application. And the answer is, yeah, because we have the time to do that now. And again, uh, saving money is another great way when you do app innovation correctly and you're doing techniques like infrastructure as code because you know me as a DevOps person. So like, why am I talking app innovation? Because I've helped people get apps into the cloud. I got to make sure now that they're into the cloud that they're using the cloud the best way possible. And one of the ways that you can do that is by saving money is by using infrastructure as code. Thinking about the infrastructure as just a feature of your application, code that lives inside of a repository, because now standing up a dev environment, a QA environment, even a staging environment is just a click of a button. It's just a deployment of your code, which means I can also destroy those environments really, really quickly. So instead of me having a QA environment that runs forever, I can actually have a QA environment spun up just in time, deploy the latest version of code to it allow my testers to do whatever testing they want to, and as soon as they're done, completely destroy the entire environment, stopping all the meters from running. So I'm no longer paying for that SQL server or that Windows server or those AKS clusters because I don't need them right now. And I didn't just turn them off. I completely deleted them because I know to get them back again is just a running of my, of my pipeline. And this also frees you when you think about things like disaster recovery. Too many people worry about disaster recovery after they're done developing. I say you should be thinking about a disaster recovery before you start developing. Like, How are we going to recover from a potential disaster that brings down everything? And infrastructure as code is an amazing way to be able to do that. Instead of everyone waking up in the middle of the night, panicking, calling everybody and paging everybody to get them into the office to get around the war table, someone just says, I got it. I'm just going to run another deployment. And everything that was broken is now fixed. Not only the code, but the infrastructure that goes with it. Yeah, yeah, I saw I saw your uh, session that you gave at Ignite, and at one point you handed it off to Abel Wang, who gave a demo where some nefarious person had literally <laughs> deleted all of his code, all of his data, and he was able to get that back up and running through uh, the infrastructure as code through YAML yeah. and through a continuous yeah. deployment. Yeah, it's an, it's amazing. It's it's really freeing to where he and I both start building the infrastructure as code for our projects before any code is built. So what you see us doing is thinking about production first. What I mean by that is I have an idea for an app. I have a product backlog. I know it wants to be in there. First thing that I do is I build a DevOps pipeline that has infrastructure as code, and I deploy it. And I look at my Azure subscription, and I make sure that everything landed right, everything's wired up correctly, and then I delete everything in my Azure subscription, and then I run my pipeline again. Moments later, what I should see in Azure is exactly what I just saw in Azure. All the resources reprovisioned, DNS records all updated, IP addresses all registered, and the, the environment, although it be empty, is perfectly ready for me to rock and roll, which means if I ever have a disaster, guess what I do? I run my pipeline and literally everything gets stood up. Once I have that pathway to production laid down like a highway, then I start adding features. I start, start coding. And what's really nice is getting into production is just a click of a button. Then, Do you approve or do you not approve the last change to go into production? Because the pipeline's been there the entire time. So many people will develop for months or years and leave develop or deployment to when we're done, we'll figure out how to deploy it. And now you have this whole other mountain to climb and right. you might have made different decisions. You might have architected it differently had you known what production was going to look like, what constraints were going to exist in your infrastructure. But if you know that up front, you're not painting yourself into a corner or then saying, wow, we finished development. Now let's start the trek to production, which is going to be just as long, if not more painful than the development itself. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a reason why people defer things like deployment and testing that integration in, in production. It's because it's hard. It's There's risk involved and there's pain involved, uh, but doing it more frequently and doing it earlier reduces a lot of that pain. And so if it's it hurt, a, do it more it often. It, it's, it seems counterintuitive, especially when you say it that way, but it's true. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, fail fast is a sort of a, <laughs> that's another way yeah, of saying Yeah, I tell it. everybody, it's like going to the gym. The, when you haven't gone to the gym in a long time and you go yeah. to the gym that first time, it's 
gut wrenching. You're 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 seeing stars. You can't breathe. You think I'll never be able to do this. Like one push up is really really hard. And then you fast forward if you stick to it and you keep doing it. And that's the key. You keep going to the gym. You look back. You're like, man, I can drop and give you 50 push ups. Now I remember when I couldn't do one of those, right? And you feel better. You look better. And what used to be hard is now easier because you're better equipped because you're more accustomed to doing it because you've done it so regularly. So if it hurts, do it more often. And what I tell a lot of people too is that. Those I've been in those teams where you're talking about where we only ship once every six months. We only do it twice a year. And it's a miserable experience. But we don't invest any time there because, well, we only do it twice a year. Now, yeah, it's painful, but why am I going to go invest all this time in automating a deployment that happens twice a year because we only ship every six months? And that's a really hard question for me to answer. I'm like, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we ship every month? Like, are you kidding me? You know how hard that deployment is? It's like, I know how easy it will be if I force you to do it every month, <laughs> right? Because you're not going to live through that hell every time you have to do a deployment. So the more frequent our deployments became, the easier they became over time because we had to automate things because we simply couldn't spend the time to do the deployments any other way. I really like that analogy about pain of going to the gym. I'm totally going to steal that <laughs> next time I talk about this. Uh, now you talked. You started out saying that originally I I, I adopted the lift and shift uh, philosophy. I had it on premises. I put it in the virtual machine. I put it in the cloud, um, and then I started thinking about how I can rearchitect that and think more about my app more to take advantage of the cloud. Is that, is that okay? Is that okay to start that way? Lift Absolutely. And shift? And then, or should I, should I do the planning up front and decide before I... The funny thing is, is that you think you know what you don't know, but you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. So even if you look at the Azure DevOps team, what used to be VSTS, for a while there, we spent a lot of time dreaming up what Azure DevOps, what is called now, would look like in the cloud, how we would tease it apart. And then eventually, we spent so much time designing... We still hadn't shipped anything yet. We're like, no, 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 we have to ship something. Like, we have deadlines, and you're spending way too much time second guessing every decision you're about to make about moving to the cloud. And it shouldn't be a microservices, or where should the databases live, and how should we tease apart, and what should be part of the monolith and not. And it's like, man, can you just please ship something? Like, you know what? Put that aside. Let's scratch this right now. Let's just put this aside and let's go lift and shift this into the cloud. And so we did exactly what you're asking. Like we lifted and shifted TFS as TFS into the cloud, changed its name and tried to run it as a service. And now here we are several years later and we have a fully enterprise grade multi-scale like this amazing deployment. But funny thing is that it looks nothing like what we had drawn up. Right. So if we had gone with what we had drawn up, we might be in a much worse shape than we are today. What we did is we lifted and shifted, and then we started to analyze what was going on, find the bottlenecks that we had in our system and in our performance, and start to tease those parts apart and start to utilize the cloud better. For example, TFS was a monolith, and we made the decision that no new services will be attached to the monolith. Everything added had to be added as a microservice. Everything added had to be added using the best technologies and the best patterns and practices that we knew at the time to be able to add that functionality so that the monolith eventually would atrophy, right? It would get smaller and smaller until hopefully eventually it just poofs away and then all you have is this beautiful microservices architecture. But again, we started just like many of our customers are forced to start. Time does not always allow you to first dream up this amazing new cloud-based architecture and to tease everything apart for how long is that going to take and how are you still going to have to maintain the old code base and the new code base while your customers transition there's a there's a lot of pros and cons and, and return on investment that you have to do to determine that but absolutely there's no wrong answer to getting to the cloud in my opinion i think there's a better answer <laughs> but i don't think there's a wrong answer if your mandate is to get off of your on-prem data centers and into the cloud i think i would encourage you to get there with as little friction as possible and then when you're in there, start to utilize it as best you possibly can. It's funny, the the things you talked about that uh, the lessons learned from the Azure DevOps team, these are the lessons that uh, the open source world learned a long time ago, that right. uh, deploy early, find out what works, get feedback and change very fast. And this whole plugin architecture, you know, rather than building this monolith uh, visual studios the i think the canonical example of that the thing that does everything for you but it takes an hour to download and an hour to install as opposed to vs code which takes a minute to download and install and if you need something else you just plug into it and sure. those are i think lessons that microsoft has learned just in the last few years no for sure from the open source community
and they're not new patterns, which is crazy, right? Like we we, right, we exactly. know these took, things, right? It just For, took us a while to learn it. <laughs> exactly. Since the 70s, they've been talking about creating very small pieces of software that are very good at one particular thing and then building a system that utilizes all of them. But it takes more time, takes more architecture, takes more planning to be able to, to dissect your application that way. And if you're in a crunch time, all of a sudden you end up with this monolith because they're easy to write. Right. But yeah. they're hard to deploy. They're hard to upgrade They're They they don't come without their challenges, which is why we're in this this world now where we're all distributed and we're all trying to figure out how we can scale individual portions of our app. Because when you want to scale a monolith, you have to scale the entire thing. Right. right. So you have to have enough hardware to duplicate the entire monolith and then scale it vertically or horizontally, however you want to. But when you're dealing with microservices, you can actually look at your traffic and say, you know what, all we need is more build. We don't need more work item tracking. We don't need more testing. We just need more build. Great, let's just spin more of that up without spinning up all these other resources. And that's why we're reaping a lot of benefits of figuring out how we can break it apart because now we can scale just individual services versus having to scale the entire monolith. But writing monoliths is very, very easy, uh, which is why they're so prolific right now. And writing microservices architecture, getting your head around the fact that every microservice has its own database, when historically every day, like we all have the exact same connection string, we might have our own schema for a fancy inside of the database, but we all have the exact same connection string using the exact same tables. And to think about how do we separate all those things can sometimes be just a mind warp for people. I think you're in a, a unique position in that you have insight into the Azure DevOps team and how they've done things and what they did well <clears throat> versus what they, they, they had to improve on. And you've got uh, connections with the developer community and the DevOps yeah. community out the world. And so you could take those lessons and transfer them. Like, yeah, and I've been writing software since 96 professionally. I think I joined Compact Computers in 96. Uh, as a matter of fact, Compact I still live right down the street. That. Yeah, you remember that? that? I remember the little iPad that I used to have. <laughs> exactly. I don't think I, I, don't know if I still have it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I have one somewhere because uh, I, I found it the other day and you look at it, you're just like, man, that was like a lifetime ago, right? This technology is, but it was ahead of its time if you really think oh, yeah. about it, right? Because it's some of the first mobile computers we had. But that, I, I live six minutes down the street from the old head, headquarters for Compact Computers. And that's where I started working back in, I believe it was 96. So not only do I pull on my experience as a, a practitioner of DevOps and Scrum from the seven years before I joined Microsoft, like the 20 years before that, I was a developer. Right. So I've seen software written in all different types of languages, all different types of software development life cycles, what goes well, what doesn't go well, the manual and the automated processes. And when you bring all that experience together, you can then take that experience with you when you go to talk to customers and apply it to concepts like DevOps and to obviously to Azure as well. Outstanding. Uh, we're covering a lot here. Is there something that we that you feel like we should cover that we haven't touched on? Oh, what I think is really important is that you you look at this as a transition through your architecture, right? One of the things that I'm a big fan of is make sure that you do agile first <laughs> and do agile well first. And then you're going to start looking at innovating your application, being able to make those changes quicker because you're a much more agile application and ag agile organization. And then also be able to apply DevOps best practices to get you into the cloud as well. Because I've noticed is when you innovate, or use app innovation, your deployment also sometimes becomes easier. Deploying VMs and deploying two VMs can be a challenge with HTTP and ports being open and where is IIS installed correctly and if the ports open, like, there's a lot of, of information that has to be stored in your infrastructure's code files that don't necessarily have to be stored when you just say spin up an app service, right? Spinning up an app service, in my opinion, is far easier than spinning up something like a VM that's configured correctly to run. Because you have to learn not only infrastructure's code, but you have to learn configuration as code or DSC to be able to configure that. So utilizing PaaS services like app service or Azure Functions or now static web apps, these things that are like packaged solutions for you, takes away all of that information that you needed to learn so that you can actually be productive more quickly. So my my recipe is get agile, right? right? Start doing DevOps best practices and start figuring out how you're going to innovate your app now that you're in the cloud. But with those three together, I think you're in really good shape to start doing some really cool stuff with the cloud and really utilizing the cloud. Like to me, you just using a VM in the cloud is not the full extent of what the cloud can do for you. It's it's just a stepping stone in my opinion, and that's why I encourage my customers to yeah you can you can lift and shift, but don't get comfortable there. Lift, shift, and then innovate as fast as you can. I heard you use the phrase DevOps best practices a couple of times there. Where's a good place for people to learn about best practices? Uh, actually, believe it or not, if you type 
Donovan Brown on YouTube, you're going to see tons of videos of me talking about that right now. Yeah, DevOps all day long. And if you put in DevOps 2, you're just going to find lots of transformation videos, lots of videos on Azure DevOps and how to get started there. Uh, David Tessar and I years ago did a really good talk about DevOps best practices. And that's where I first got introduced to things like infrastructure as code. Being a developer, infrastructure was a foreign entity to me. I didn't want to know anything about it. I wanted someone else like Rick Claus or, or some of my other friends who do IT pro kind of stuff to deal with that for me. But when you start doing infrastructure as code, the two of those teams have to start to communicate with each other. I learned enough about infrastructure, but I'm still no IT pro. I don't know how many layers there are on a network stack or any of that kind of stuff. But I do understand that I need to be thinking about my infrastructure before I deploy there so that I can start understanding what constraints, if any, are going to be inside of my infrastructure, how it's going to be architected so that I can then architect my application to take the best advantage of those resources. So those best practices are infrastructure as code, continuous integration, a great branching strategy, uh, building it with agile methodologies and techniques so that you're building small increments of code. Um, those type of things automate everything that you possibly can are some of the best practices that we're talking about. All right, that's a good place. I, I saw tons of videos here under Donovan Brown. Right. Mostly for you, there's some singer named Donovan Brown. I know, and there's a Canadian actor too who's trying to push <laughs> in on my stuff. And there's a little kid who plays basketball, so I got to do more content so I can outweigh you are, You're doing a good job of pushing them down <laughs> to page two and three. And I've also noticed you've been going crazy on your blog recently. Last week you had, what, five or six blog posts? Yeah, it was, a, it was an active week, and I've, I've been playing. I'm a, I'm a fan of PowerShell. And I created this PowerShell module called VS Team that you can use to connect to Azure DevOps from PowerShell. And it was just a pet project. My manager was like, I have no idea why you're doing that, but if you seem to be having fun, just go knock yourself out. And then you, I wake up and then half a million downloads. And you're like, holy mackerel, wow. this is, like, yeah, exactly what I said. I was like, wow, like, I never imagined that this would ever be this popular. And I have like 40 some odd contributors to this open source project. And we're constantly working in there trying to innovate it. And one of the things that I've been toying with lately is, do I take it from pure PowerShell and repackage it as a binary module, which basically means writing the command that's in C Sharp. So what I've been doing is lots of investment of porting some of my older modules over, trying to understand what the development experience is for a developer. Does it really make it easier or harder? Am I going to alienate some of my contributors that are contributing now because it's pure PowerShell if I move over to C Sharp? So this weekend I was learning a lot about writing cross-platform PowerShell. So I started blogging all that stuff. My wife made the same comment that you said, like, man, every time I walk in your office, you're writing another blog post. I'm like, I'm learning a lot, right? And that's what I do on my blog is I share what I learned because if I didn't know this, there's chances are other people didn't know this. And what's also funny is if I don't write a blog on it, I'll forget it. And even sometimes when I do write a blog on it, I still forget it because I'll go searching for the answer and then I'll find our blog yeah, exactly, that's exactly like, why I, I, I blog. This. <laughs> exactly. My like, blogs are just uh, cheat sheets to my future self. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, this weekend was very active for me and my wife. Uh, it was weird because it was like she didn't come in. She usually comes in my office every morning. And I noticed it was like one o'clock and she hadn't come in yet. I was just like, I just keep working. I'm sure she's fine. She's like, yeah, I just could tell you were in like a zone. So she just didn't bother me. And all weekend I was just coding like crazy. She sounds like a keeper. Oh man, you have no idea how lucky I am. <laughs> no idea. I wouldn't put up with Donovan the way that she puts up with Donovan. <laughs> well, Donovan, thanks for putting up with us for oh, my pleasure. this interview. And you stay safe. You too, my friend. Take care. In this pressing time that we're all living in today, it's amazing to be able to use technology to still connect with my friends, like my friend David.